بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Thank you, uh, Fred, for that uh, too generous of an introduction. Uh, it is kind of you, but it uh, makes my work harder. You've set the bar a bit uh, too hard uh, or too high, but uh, it is indeed uh, an honor uh, for me to be addressing your esteemed audience. I want to start by uh, thanking you, Governor Huntsman, uh, for bringing the Atlantic Council and its uh, reputed uh, expertise and convening power and ability to analyze and impact uh, policy going forward uh, here to us in the region, to the GCC, and you can tell from the attendance from the GCC that we're uh, extremely uh, energized by having your inaugural Global Energy Forum held here in uh, the great city of Abu Dhabi uh, in uh, the UAE. I want also to acknowledge our gracious hosts uh, from the government of uh, United Arab Emirates and uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, in particular, Their Excellencies uh, Suhail al mazrui and Dr. Sultan Al-Jaber, my dear friends. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coordinating and working with the Council to hold this uh, event. I also uh, want to uh, start by uh, expressing uh, the condolences of my own country uh, and me personally uh, for the tragic and senseless loss of five brave UAE uh, diplomats uh, while conducting uh, a very courageous uh, humanitarian mission uh, in Afghanistan and indeed your loss uh, is our loss uh, and in fact the world's loss uh, and everybody mourns with you. But uh, Your Excellency uh, Suhail Mazrui, as you said this morning uh, when you uh, addressed the opening uh, session, the mega trends in energy have always had a profound implications for politics, security, economics, and societies and their development. The debate you and the Atlantic Council are fostering here will be a most welcome addition. Uh, and today, I would like to share some thoughts on these mega trends the way I see them, including the oil market's future direction, which I'm sure is of interest to many of you. And I would also like to connect uh, those mega trends with what uh, Fred referred to in his uh, opening introduction, our strategic thinking in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and our transformative plan. Of course, when it comes to energy, there are several realities that policymakers around the world must face. Let me focus on what I consider to be the four primary ones. First, the fact that demand for energy will continue to grow and it must be met, notwithstanding the choice of energy sources. Today, the world's primary energy demand is about 280 million barrels per day of oil equivalent. Over the next 25 years, by 2040, we expect it to grow by more than 40%. That is roughly 400 million, as around 2 billion additional people are added to our population. And as all of the population of the planet continues to thrive, with reasonable expectations of higher standards of living. Of course, the pace of energy growth will be moderated by continued efficiency improvement. Otherwise, it would be higher than the number I just quoted. The second reality is that the world has come together in an unprecedented manner on climate change. Again, Fred referred to this. We are entering a new era, and the watershed moment was, of course, the COP21 Paris Agreement that was reached in 2015 and ratified by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia last year, as well as many of our GCC 
partners, uh, together indeed with over 100 countries that brought that agreement into effect. Of course, nations that are the greatest emitters have a proportionally greater responsibility to hold firm to their commitments. That's why, arguably, the 2014 joint announcement on climate change between the US and China was an even more catalytic moment than signing the Paris Agreement itself. Certainly, the joint ratification of Paris between these two nations was profoundly symbolic. However, everyone else must contribute their share. And that's why we recognize that we, too, need to do our part in the kingdom to implement this agreement and reduce carbon emissions, especially given our global energy leadership role. For example, we will diversify our utilities fuel mix, which is entirely fueled by liquids today, in the coming decades with renewables and clean natural gas, which will account for around 70% of Saudi Arabia's utilities that will be, and it will be the highest by any G20 nation. So gas by itself will be 70%. But action is not limited to governments. Companies must also play their part. And I am particularly excited by the potential of the oil and gas climate initiative comprising large IOCs, large NOCs, and our national oil company, Saudi Aramco, has played a key part in this. Last November, OGCI announced a $1 billion investment to develop and commercially deploy innovative low-emissions technologies. And that's just the sort of industry-led, technology-driven, and highly collaborative approach that we need to reach our climate objectives. Third reality is the global potential of renewables, which is staggering. Just looking at solar, it's been calculated that every 90 minutes, an hour and a half, 15 billion tons of oil equivalent of energy from the sun reaches the Earth's surface. In an hour and a half, that's more than the planet needs in an entire year. Similarly, wind could theoretically supply the equivalent of 146 billion tons of oil equivalent of energy every year, which is more than 10 times the world's current annual primary energy needs. So the potential supply is massive, and so is the growing demand for clean energy. The challenge is to bridge the gaps in technology and economics and fully tap this enormous potential. The fourth reality, and it's really a conclusion from the first three, is that despite the potential of renewables, the increased demand I mentioned earlier can only met by using all energy sources. Because history tells us that transition to alternatives and renewables and new forms of energy will be long and complex. Indeed, while the share of legacy fuels in the global energy mix has fallen in percentage terms, the absolute demand for these energy sources continues to rise. Coal is a case in point. Looking specifically at oil and gas prospects, which are very important to us here in the region, as you would imagine, while their share in the future energy mix would moderate in percentage terms, it seems certain to remain significant for decades to come, and in fact, oil and gas demand will continue to grow in absolute terms for the foreseeable future. So I'm not that strong of a believer in peak demand, Fred. I believe, not anytime soon anyway, I believe that every drop of oil which can be economically recovered will be produced and consumed in due course. And its value over time will actually appreciate. The notion of stranded resources is not one we recognize in Saudi Arabia and, in my opinion, is misleading to markets. 
Ladies and gentlemen, these are the four principal realities facing policymakers. And they clearly demonstrate that business as usual is not an option. However, there are numerous uncertainties within each of them, which could lead us down three different paths and therefore require us to be flexible and agile and willing to change as we evolve in this transition going forward. The first scenario, or potential scenario, that is being discussed is one where alternatives and renewables struggle to make inroads due to weak implementation of the Paris Agreement, lagging technology improvements, and inadequate policy support. I believe the chances of this happening are very low, and that the alternatives and renewables will continue to, to gain. Modern renewables have made important strides, make no mistakes about it, and have indeed become a huge business with spectacular growth in wind and solar, albeit from a very small base to start with. Electric vehicles, on the other hand, are starting to make steady progress and we believe will continue to grow. The second equally improbable scenario is where alternatives and renewables quickly dominate including the large share currently occupied by coal in power generation across the world's developing and developed nations where we see about 80% of electricity in India being generated by coal, about 70% in China, even in developed countries like Germany where 45% of electricity is, developed, is, is produced by coal and about a third of U.S. electricity is generated by coal. Such a renewable-dominated scenario would, in fact, not only require renewables to rapidly replace coal, but also gas, which is highly unlikely, given the further improvements needed in renewables technology and electricity storage. Of course, the biggest challenge that renewables have is the intermittency issue with solar and wind that can only be mitigated by the flexibility and reliability offered by fossil fuels to complement them. Similarly, in transport, the heavy transport sector is likely to remain dependent on oil for the foreseeable future. And twice the number of vehicles will be on the roads by 2050, or requiring market penetration levels for electric vehicles, which are still a long way from being realistic. In my view, the most likely scenario is the middle path, where both renewables and electric vehicles do gain share, but where the world will still need conventional fuels, fossil fuels, and all these sources contribute to the energy mix for quite some time. I therefore believe we need to continue promoting renewables while also setting challenging cost and efficiency, efficiency targets, minimize subsidies, especially as technologies improve, and devote major resources to electricity storage and grid integrity. At the same time, and this is important for us in the oil and gas industry, we must continue to make timely investments in proven and reliable conventional sources like oil and gas to ensure their availability and sustainability during the long transition period to avoid impacting the world's energy security and to ensure continued economic development for the billions of people who are counting on it. We also need to keep pushing the envelope of technological advancements and achieve real breakthroughs including the development of ultra-clean oil and gas. And as I said earlier, it is essential to have prudent energy policies that reliably deliver adequate, affordable, and sustainable energy supplies while this transition takes place. Speaking of transitions, and as Fred mentioned, last year we launched our own rapid transformation strategy in the kingdom which we named Vision 2030. Economic sustainability is at the vision's heart with comprehensive reforms, greater economic diversification, 
by moving the national economy to a position where it relies on multiple economic engines instead of a single commodity. Also, fiscal responsibility, private sector-led growth, and the privatization of the key state-owned enterprises. The vision also supports the intent of the Paris Agreement by diversifying our energy mix. Let me pick a few highlights. In the fiscal arena, our recent 2017 budget included a plan to balance our budget by 2020 while keeping our debt to 30% of GDP. We will achieve this by continuing to optimize our spending efficiency in the government and diversifying our non-oil revenues, including a GCC-wide value-added tax to be implemented next year. In the domestic energy sector, we have launched significant reforms, beginning with the gradual deregulation of energy prices last year, including electricity, water, and transport fuels. These price reforms, coupled with the Saudi Energy Efficiency Program, have already started to pay results. Overall, energy demand, which has been increasing at 5 to 6 percent for a long time, registered only half a percent last year, a significant drop. Looking ahead, the combined energy and water price reforms alone are expected to save over 200 billion riyals annually by the year 2020. That is about $60 billion. We're also committed to expanding renewables. We have ambitions to turn the kingdom into a solar powerhouse with an initial target of 9.5 gigawatt of renewables in the short term by 2023, and it will continue to grow. On privatization, of course, the most widely talked about example is the public offering of a share in our national oil company, Saudi Aramco, which will be the largest IPO in history, and we're still forecasting to do that in 2018. We also are unbundling the Saudi Electricity Company, the largest utility in the region, into generation, transmission, and distribution, and about 65 gigawatt of generation will be split into four generation companies that will be privatized. All future increments of power generation will be undertaken by the private sector. Outside the energy and mineral sector, we're considering an IPO of seaports, airports, water desalination, and even the Saudi stock exchange itself, the Dowell, is planned to be listed in 2018. It is a breathless pace, but there is no time to waste for us in the kingdom. Building a sustainable economy for future generations means we must move quickly on multiple fronts and do it now. Finally, let me be absolutely clear. Nothing I have said in any way downgrades the importance we place on oil's role globally and its central role in our domestic economy. That's why we have been leading global efforts towards balanced markets. They have been, the markets, through a period of high volatility which has hit producing nations and the energy industry itself extremely hard. In particular, the uncertainty about the future has impacted investment levels and jobs in the industry, which is a particular concern to me. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have been moving towards a rebalanced market for some time. A bit too slowly for my liking, but we indeed have been moving in that direction. The even better news is that the pace of rebalancing will be accelerated by the recent production agreements within OPEC and with our partners from outside the OPEC organization. I have confidence in this collaborative and transparent approach, and I believe these agreements will benefit producing, and for that matter, consuming nations alike by bringing stability to global markets, as well as attracting investments 
that are essential to the world's long-term energy security. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that these remarks help set the scene for your deliberations over the next couple of days as this great gathering continues to debate. Transitioning to the sustainable future energy we all want, and Abu Dhabi is hosting with their uh, sustainability week, is incredibly challenging and complex, and it requires the contributions and cooperations of each and every one of us. Once again, I thank the Atlantic Council and our colleagues from the UAE for uh, bringing us together to debate these issues. Thank you very much.